Good morning, Wabash. Speaking today at Pioneer Chapel will be David Lewis with his talk titled, Near Misses, A Few Wins, and Reflections. David Lewis is a 1977 graduate of Arsenal Technical High School in Indianapolis, Wabash College class of 1981 with a major in economics, and a 1984 graduate of the Indiana University School of Law in Bloomington. While at Wabash, he participated in the Speakers Bureau, Pre-Law Society, College Republicans, Student Senate, Glee Club, Sphinx Club, and his fraternity of Phi Gamma Delta. He also hosted a talk show for three years with the coach of the Wabash Little Giants football team, then Stan Parrish, which aired on local Crawfordsville television on Monday nights. After his education, Dave engaged in the private practice of law for four years before joining Eli Lilly and Company in 1988. At Lilly, where he spent the next 30 years, he rose to the senior management role of vice president of global taxes and chief tax executive. After leaving Lilly in 2018, he served from 2018 to 2022 as managing director within the Price Waterhouse Coopers. He served as one of the founding leaders of PwC's CEO Action for Racial Equity Fellowship, a nationwide nonpartisan business-driven racial equity initiative. Mr. Lewis is married to Lynn, and they have three adult children, one who attended Wabash, a daughter-in-law, a son-in-law, a future daughter-in-law, and three grandchildren. They reside in Indianapolis and have a second, uh, second home in Sarasota, Florida. Finally, Mr. Lewis is also president of the Indy Championships Fund, chairman of the Board of Tax Foundation in Washington, D.C., and serves on numerous for-profit and not-for-profit boards. Most importantly, however, he is a member of the Board of Trustees and Executive Committee at Wabash College, including chair of the Audit and Enterprise Risk Committee. Let's give a warm welcome to Dave. Thank you, Cooper. I appreciate that, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Thank you for that warm welcome. Um, it's, um, I would also add that I was the fortunate recipient of a four-year fully paid scholarship, the Lilly Scholarship, to Wabash College. And um, on the day that I uh, had the final interview, I was interviewing before an esteemed panel of faculty and, and alumni. My, my mom told me the story the other day. She's 96 years old. And she told me a story the other day that she, as I walked into Spark Center, she turned and looked at my dad and, and she said, that she, here's how she said it, as you exited our car and walked towards the Spark Center, I turned to your dad and said, this could change his life. And she was absolutely correct. Wabash College did change my life and for that I am very grateful and I hope it's changing yours. Um, at Wabash, I was a little bit unsure about this all-male thing, okay, I have to admit. I grew up with five sisters and no brothers, so you talk about cultural change. It was, uh, it was massive cultural change. And I didn't work, I, I kind of breezed through high school and didn't really push myself, so the academic rigor was a cold shock, particularly that first composition paper with the big F at the bottom. Um, that kind of woke me up. It was the kick in the gluteus maximus I needed. And um, after that, I made sure I made the dean's list. But I will say one other thing about Wabash. Those long days of studying, the activities that you highlighted, Cooper. Um, at Wabash College, I got to practice leadership, and I got to practice communication at a very early stage in my life. And again, I'm most grateful for that. Now, as Cooper shared, I spent 30 years at Eli Lilling Company. I was able to build a world-class global organization. I was able to lead audit defenses uh, before tax authorities all over the world, covering about 40 years. Um, I was also had the honor of being recognized as one of the leading uh, tax policy leaders within the US uh, tax community and the biopharma tax community. Led numerous advocacy coalitions in Washington, DC, and in Puerto Rico, Indiana, and in Europe and even um, served as the leader of a coalition about which I will talk shortly in terms of uh, some of the things I have done. I currently still chair the Tax Foundation, which is a leading think tank based in Washington, D.C. I've also had a great opportunity to serve my community in Indianapolis. I've uh, been able to serve on the 500 Festival. I was a principal player in organizing and delivering the Super Bowl in 2012. Um, we. Uh, 
we had did a comprehensive economic study of the region, and I was able to lead that regional strategy council for five or six years. And I even graduated from the FBI Citizens Academy. I currently, as you mentioned, chair the Indy Championships Fund. And just to give you a sense for what that is, um, when Indi Indianapolis is, has been hosting marquee sporting events, and next year will be the NBA All-Star Game. Last January was the 2022 uh, college football playoff national championship game. And the championship fund funds and, and helps coordinate the funding, raises the money to deliver those events in Indianapolis. So it's an, a pivotal part of our success and our sports strategy in Indianapolis. Now, get on to business, okay? Last time, well not last time, but in 1978 I stood at this podium. Now, I was a sophomore and the Monon Bell had just been stolen. We, um, well, let me tell you what the DePaul said about this particular incident. The, uh, the DePaul said, quote, members of DePaul Sigma Chi stole the bell from the Wabash Gym only weeks prior to the game. Around 200 to 300 Wabash men stormed the campus to retrieve it taking over a sorority in the process. <laughs> Eleven people were arrested, unquote. Now let me tell you the actual story, okay? So they stole the bell. And so a friend of mine was the student senate president, so we decided we needed to organize something. We called for a rally in this very chapel and at this very podium. I had rewritten the Gettysburg Address, and I turned it into the Dannysburg Address. <laughs> Another guy rewrote President Roosevelt's declaration of war against the Japanese. <laughs> we were up here delivering our speeches, and we were finished, and we really had no plan beyond the speeches. And one young man stood up. I do believe he may have had some beverages before he arrived. Uh, but I, I, and by the way, I'm not endorsing any of this behavior, okay? <laughs> he said, I don't know why we're standing or sitting in here making speeches. I say we go to DePaul, we take over a sorority, and we stay there until they return the bell. And we all turned and looked at him and said, brilliant. <laughs> Whereupon we... If you were a trucker in those days, there were these CB radios, breaker, breaker, those kinds of things. And if you were listening, you would have heard them saying things like, what is going on in Crawfordsville? Everybody is leaving. Because there was a row of cars going down 231 to DePaul. And you've not seen the sight until you see the 200 to 300 guys tiptoe up to a sorority house, knock on the door, the door opens, and they all go cascading in. <laughs> the poor house mom, this is the story. The poor house mom turned to one guy and said, who's your leader? Who's your leader? And he responded, ma'am, we don't have a leader. We're what you call a mob. <laughs> so, so then we heard that our fine gentleman friends at DePauw had convened on the other side of East College with various tools, and we ran over there, and whereupon we were greeted with a line of men and state police cars separating, and the, and the uh, Putnam County Sheriff cars separating us, and we all screamed and hollered back and forth, and eventually the police said, we need to talk to somebody. And so somehow, as I remember it, I ended up negotiating with the president of the college over the front hood of a state police cruiser, and we cut a deal to get the bell back. The, the next day, we did indeed get the bell back on Monument Circle, but we did have 11 guys get arrested. So in a testament to this college, we, after we cut the deal, we all headed back. Four or five of us went door to door, fraternity to fraternity, dorm to dorm, and we raised $550 to bail them out. We then... One fraternity was emptying their Coke machine. We took coins, bills, whatever we could get, and we left no man behind. 
So that's, that's what happened last time I was at this podium. Okay, we'll try to keep it a little. <laughs> now, on to more important things. The title uh, was Near Misses, A Few B Big Wins and Reflections. And so I'm just going to say that the, the near misses and the, the few big wins is kind of setting context. The part I really hope that you'll take the heart of the reflections. And these are the kind of the things of what did I learn along the way? Because what I'm going to share, no one teaches in classes. You learn it from experience. And so let's talk about the near misses. I actually have had a lot of near misses, near brushes with death. In fact, um, each of these quickly instances I'll summarize, people have told me they need to be, each one could be a chapter in the book you should write. I haven't written the book, but if you want to be my silent, uh, uh, quiet author behind it, let me know. Um, but I've been the victim of an armed robbery. I've been held at gunpoint, criminally confined. I was in the World Trade Center in 1993, not 2001, but it was the first time it was bombed. And you know that war on terrorism that y'all have grown up with? That was the first act of terrorism on U.S. soil. And a guy drove a box truck into the basement of the World Trade Center and blew it up. His intent was to topple the building and leave a destruction of path of death twice the height of the World Trade Center. He came 18 inches from doing that. Um, I was on the 55th floor, and you know, jumping wasn't much of an option. And so, uh, you know, so there I was there. What an experience. Soon after, I was on a corporate jet that got hit by lightning, slicing right through the skin of the plane, bending the stabilizer wings, way to do an emergency landing. No one wanted to travel with me anymore for some reason. Um, and uh, we were greeted as we did our emergency landing by ambulances and fire trucks on the runway, but fortunately, we had a safe landing. My wife and I just missed the bombing at Centennial Park during the 1996 Olympics. Um, our home burnt down in 1999. We lost everything. And it took us about a year to uh, rebuild our lives. And then on September 11th, I, 2001, I was on an airplane flying into D.C. and undoubtedly had to be one of the last airplanes to pass over the Pentagon before it was hit by an airplane as part of the destruction that happened that day. And I was in D.C. as people realized the Capitol was under attack. And there was rumors of multiple planes heading to the White House Guess where I was standing? Right next to the White House. So, quite frankly, no one wanted to travel with me anymore. Um, but, but those were the kinds of things that test you. So I call them, a, you know, a near misses. Now the big wins. After that 2001 incident, um, there, the leaders were convened at the destruction side of the World Trade Center. Our economy was starting to fall into decline. And the leaders of Congress brought together labor and business to try to develop ideas to uh, stimulate the economy, to get things moving again. And our CEO, Lilly, was asked to go, and he turned to me and said, hey, you got any ideas? And I had one idea. And, and I'm not going to make you tax experts, which I spent my career being. But I will tell you that at that time, U.S. tax laws disfavored U.S. headquartered multinational corporations, in that if companies headquartered in the U.S. earned income abroad, if they wanted to bring that money back to the United States to invest in the U.S. economy, it was fully taxed. And so the behavior was to leave it outside the United States. So my idea was, let's give U.S. headquartered multinationals a one-year window to bring all that money into the United States and invest it in the economy to stimulate the economy. Congress liked the idea. At least some of the leaders did. And so it launched me on um, a life-altering experience. And, and basically, within the next several months, I built a, a nationwide coalition of companies, 60 companies that you would all know the names of, 15 large trade associations. We built a team of accounting, tax, and legal experts, economists, media consultants, lobbyists. We had to create a broad-based, broad industry-based um, coalition. We had big names in D.C. that we, we recruited to join us. We had to have independent economic analysis, targeted media. Uh, we had to win bipartisan support in both the Senate and the House, and we had to have the capability to respond to every criticism and question in real time. Ultimately, we failed in 2001. We failed in 2002. We failed again in 2003. And each time it would be in, it would be out, but we failed. But in 2004, 
after being put into a Senate bill, being taken out of the Senate bill, we got it through the Senate, and then it went to the companion bill, went through the House, we got it in, it was out, in, out, and we got it in, and then they convened a conference committee between the two um, houses, and it was in, it was out, but ultimately it was enacted into law. This was a big win for me, and quite frankly, a big win for our country. If you measure it in today's dollars, about a half trillion dollars was brought back into the U.S. economy. Um, GDP was increased by over 1%. About 500,000 jobs were estimated to have been created over at the ensuing two-year period, and the U.S. government got a bunch of tax revenue because they did tax that revenue that came back. And more importantly, it triggered a debate that went on for 13 years until 2017 about how we taxed U.S. headquartered multinational corporations in the United States. And that was changed and improved in 2017. One described the initiative that I just described as our effort changed the economic history of the United States. It's fun to be part of that. It's fun to lead something like that. So that brings me to the reflections part. But first, the story, OK? And it's relevant. All right, I'm sitting in the airport at Heathrow. One morning, I see this article. Pigs might fly, but cows sunk our boat. Now, that catches your eye when you see that story. The story is that a bunch of Japanese fishermen were out fishing. They, um, and and they, they alleged that cows sunk their boat. And they were being charged with insurance fraud. But further investigation discovered that when the Soviet Union was collapsing, some Soviet Air Force folks commandeered one of those big transport planes where the back opens and flew it up to the Sakhalin Islands, rustled about 100 cows onto it, closed it up, took it back up into the air to bring the, back, the, the cows back to the Soviet Union to sell them. The article literally says, but the cows, unaccustomed to flying, began to stampede inside the plane, and they were losing control of the plane. So they opened the back, and the cows ran off. So sure enough, they learned that cows were falling from the sky. They hit a Japanese ship, and our, our fishing vessel, and did, in fact, sink the boat. Now keep that in mind, cows falling from the sky, because I'm going to talk about behaviors that get you through near misses, big winds, or when cows are falling from the sky. Okay. So, and, and these behaviors, I have to give credit to a couple colleagues at Lilly. We worked on these and building these, these into a, a cohesive set of behaviors to talk about. Uh, and you'll find these, these behaviors discussed in many leadership books. So this is just my spin, okay? But those behaviors, and I, I believe they build critical partnerships, with trusted partnerships with folks. And those behaviors are mindset, Listening, leadership, and trust. So let's talk about each of them. Mindset, five words. Positivity, focus, persistence, passion, and bias for action. And let me tell you, these are gonna be important in your career, so, so keep those in mind. But positivity, everyone loves working with someone that is positive, and they don't like working with someone who isn't. Positive mindset. Focus, persistence, and passion. Remember what I said? 2001, we failed. 2002, we failed. 2003, you got to stay at it. You got to retool, restructure, and you got to go forward with passion. And then finally, in the most important set of words, I think, I'm going to tell you three or four important sets of words. This is one of them, a bias for action. Bias for action is looking around in your, in your job, in your life, in your fraternity, in your dorm, it doesn't matter. But looking at circumstances where something needs to be addressed, identifying who needs to come together to address it, having that conversation, building a plan, and then you execute it. You don't wait for someone else to tell you what to do. You do it. Bias for action will always get you ahead. Now, listening. You earn the right to advise or recommend or lead people by listening. 
All right, God gave you two ears and one mouth, so listen two-thirds of the time. And it's important to let people tell their story. When someone's talking to you about a problem or a challenge, there's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's an end. Don't cut them off. Let them tell the story. And don't be, and listen, don't be sitting there practicing what you're going to say. Listen to what they're telling you. I think it's the movie Pulp Fiction. There's a great line. Are you a person who listens or waits to talk? Be the person that listens. It's a very powerful tool. And by the way, some point in your lives, you're going to be advocating for something. You're going to be debating for something. You're going to be negotiating. And silence is a really powerful tool. So listening can be very powerful because if someone declares something and you don't respond, oftentimes they will say it a different way again. And if you don't respond, they'll do it again. And somewhere in there, you'll pick up a nugget of information that gives you advantage. So remember, silence is a very powerful tool. Leadership. Leadership can be very nebulous. But I will just tell you, just like I said, your right to advise comes from listening. People buy into a person first, and then they will listen to their thoughts, their ideas, or their recommendations. And so leadership really turns on your character, your integrity, your confidence, and your vision. And when I talk about character, I mean you stand for a value. You stand for an ideal. And, and your words, your actions are consistent with what you, what you stand for. And integrity, you have nothing to hide, nothing to fear. And your decisions, your actions reflect your ideals. And when I talk about confidence, I'm not talking about egomania or pomposity. I'm talking about certainty in your mission and resolve in taking the actions necessary to get it done. That's your guiding star. And vision is putting some, that is what guides your actions. Just like as I led that national coalition, I had a vision. And I was pursuing that vision with passion. So that's leadership. Ultimately, a leader is a person who stands for something, that mission, that vision. Their words match their their principles or their mission, their actions match their words, and people have repeat experiences with that cohesiveness coming together. Not just once, repeat experiences, continuous experiences. And, and so that's, that is what defines leadership ultimately. It's a very nebulous thing. And then trust. Trust is a dance. Trust is a dance. And, and if you, the, the one thing I would say to you is, the best way to build trust, another set of words, make yourself vulnerable first. You give a little piece of yourself to someone, they give you a little piece of them back. You give a bigger piece of yourself to someone, they give a bigger piece back. And in building trusted relationships, albeit in business or personally, building that trust is a critical piece to building a successful and trusted relationship. So keep that in mind. Make yourself vulnerable first. Now, I, sh I think the last thing I'd say about trust is you got to leave your self-orientation uh, at the door because nothing will create more distrust than somebody who cares about themselves more than they care about the issue or the person with whom they are interacting. So those are the behaviors I want you to walk away with that I learned along the way. Mindset, listening, leadership, building trust. Because one day, you're going to find yourself in a situation where cows are falling from the sky. Okay? You're going to find yourself in a situation where you've got to be a problem solver. And those skills, those behaviors will lead you through that moment. And it can be a small moment or it can be a big moment. But it will happen. And I call it leading from your chair. Others will call it leading from the seat in which you sit. Leading, lead from your chair. And I, I will tell you, I'll go back to September 11th. You remember, um, I know you guys were all just thoughts in your parents' heads at that time. But there was an airplane that crashed in Pennsylvania. And that airplane was almost Indiana, quite frankly, uh, before it was turned around. And, you know, in that time, there were little telephones in the back seats of the headrests of, uh, on the airplanes. And... Um, not everybody had mobile phones then, but passengers on that plane knew they had been hijacked. We had been all taught to sit in your seat, but they didn't. 
Through the phones, they talking to ground control or calling family, they knew they were part of something big. They knew that airplanes had been turned into missiles and that they were riding in a missile. And they took those little pieces of information, they devised a plan, they executed the plan, and they lost their lives. But they probably saved mine because they believed that plane was coming back to the White House and I was right next to the White House. And so they could well have saved my life. But you know what they did? They led from their chairs. They were in that situation that requires leadership. And I will tell you that I hope you never find yourself in a circumstance that requires you to sacrifice your life, but you'll find yourself in challenging circumstances and the behaviors of mindset, listening, leadership, and trust can guide you through that. That's what I learned along the way. Now, I'm gonna to touch on one last thing, then we'll wrap up. As you, go, as you graduate from Wabash and you go into your careers, there's a theory of career development that's 10% education, 20% relationships, and 70% experiential. Now, you're, you're covering the 10% right now. You're getting a great education. You're learning to think. 20% is relationships, and I tell folks, have mentors, have a peer mentor. In your first job, find a mentor. At the company or, or the place, the institution you're working, find someone who can be a mentor for the, for, for, on your career aspirations. You might even have a mentor in your personal lives. But have multiple mentors because no one person has a lock on all knowledge. So I, or, or, and that's the 20%. Those are the relationships you build. But 70% is experiential. And I often ran into people in my career who were waiting for someone to give them the experience to develop themselves in their careers. And they would come to me and say, you need to give me this experience. And let me tell you my philosophy, and this is leading from your chair. Every one of you, when you move, em embark into the world, and you can start today and, and through your career, need to be thinking about where you want to be in five years, what you want to be doing in 10 years, and then you ask yourself, what do I need to be capable of when I reach that point? And then you need to ask, what experiences do I need to deliver to myself? Not wait on someone else. What experiences do I need to deliver to myself to get me ready for that moment when opportunity presents itself? And that's leading from your chair right now. And you can start practicing that at this very moment. If, if you think anyone cares more about your career than you, you're wrong or stupid. You should care more about your career you should care more about your life than anyone. So don't wait for someone to give you experiences. Go out and grab them. And that's what I would tell you in terms of the experiential elements. So I'm gonna conclude. Um, when you have a near miss, when you have a great opportunity, or cows are just simply falling from the sky, remember mindset, positivity, focus, persistence, passion, and a bias for action. Listening, that art of listening, you earn your right. Leadership, your character, your integrity, confidence, your vision, and build trust through your credibility, your reliability, the intimacy that you build by giving a, making yourself vulnerable and not being self-oriented. And lastly, I think all of this can be captured easily by living by the gentleman's rule. Um, I was, um, I'm going to wrap up by just sharing one thought. I ran across a quote one day, and I've never been able to forget that. And it was, notes that were taken, that these, these, these were notes taken from a major in the US Armed Forces. They were found in his notes. They were reread in his eulogy at his funeral after he died in Iraq. And those words were, quote, be a man of principle, fight for what you believe in, keep your word, live with integrity, be brave, believe in something bigger than yourself, serve your country, 
teach, mentor, give something back to society, lead from the front, conquer your fears, be a good friend, be humble and be self-confident, appreciate your friends and family, be a leader and not a follower, be valorous in the field of battle, and take responsibility for your actions." Unquote. What is that? It's the gentleman's rule. And so I urge you, as you embark upon the rest of your career here at Wabash College, and whatever you do after, to anticipate that moments will present themselves when you need to be the person that leads from your chair. Be that man that he talked about. Take the principles of, of mindset, of listening, of leadership, and of building trust and apply them, and you will find the outcome will work out for you. It's been a pleasure to be here.